Just I'm going to. Hello, guys. You're tired of me, but now I'm a session chair, so you will have uh, <laughs> more fun of me. Okay, so I understand that um, um, Enrique Vasquez Simadeni is giving us uh, an exciting talk, and uh, it's a long talk, so I will not go through all of it. It will be molecular cloud assembly and growth, and he will <laughs> tell you the rest of the, his title. Okay, well, uh, great. So, uh, well, thanks a lot for the opportunity to do this discussion session, uh, especially because that now gives me the chance to make my, to do my, uh, my required Carl anecdote. Uh, I, this actually refers to a paper by him, which may not be known to uh, many people in this room, because it refers to dynamical systems, Carl tells me that this was his first project when he entered graduate school. So uh, he was just working, you know, what, what should I do? Well, I should do a paper that has accumulated about a thousand citations. <laughs> and, uh, but this is a paper that is mostly known in the nonlinear dynamics community. Is like a reference paper on chaos and, and nonlinear systems, attractors, and, and things like that. And how did I come uh, across this paper? Well, it, it was because uh, I also started doing something different from what I do now. When I was doing my master's thesis, uh, I actually took a class from a professor uh, on galactic dynamics, and this class contained absolutely zero galactic dynamics. That was really funny. But it contained all of nonlinear dynamics. It contained chaos, fractals, uh, attractors, and iterations, instabilities, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then I decided I liked the stuff. And I, I went to work with that professor. And, uh, and the thing he told me is, go simulate this on the computer. And so that's how I got uh, to know that paper. Uh, then what happened is that professor never paid attention to me until the paper, our own paper, was published. And so I said, well, I like nonlinear dynamics, nonlinear stuff, but uh, I sort of don't like this professor, so I'll change. And I started doing turbulence, and that's how my story began. But this paper was, for me, extremely influential. And it, it was essentially the, 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 uh, uh, the bone of my master's thesis. And then continuing to, uh, to pay homage to some of the things that I've learned from Carl, even though I was never his student, but I've known him long enough to learn quite a few things from him. And one thing is that you may have noticed in the video that was shown not uh, about a couple of hours ago, is that he was wearing a t-shirt that, that said, subvert the dominant paradigm. Okay, and when I saw him, I was present at that 24, 2004 conference, and when I saw that, T-shirt. I, you know, I was totally crazy about it. La years later, I asked him about it, and he didn't remember what had happened to it. And now I saw it on the video, so I, it was great to me, and so that's why I'm quoting it here. And that's a perfect title to the kind of things that I'm, I want to do for this discussion session. I want to subvert the dominant paradigm a little bit. So I'm going to throw a few uh, questions that may go a little bit beyond, uh, but totally on purpose. So for <laughs> so the first one is uh, where all these years of working with the magnetic field have led me to think that magnetic criticality maybe just be an observational artifact, uh, not an intrinsic feature of clouds. And why is that? That is because. Magnetic flux tubes, if any, if any such thing exists, because uh, field lines get twisted and tangled, and who knows what a flux tube looks like you know, several parsecs away. But even if you assume that they continue and they go around the galaxy, well, they go around the galaxy. So you've got about uh, pi, 2 pi kiloparsecs, or like 20 pi kiloparsecs of material. So certainly, that's plenty of material to get uh, supercritical. Uh, to become supercritical inside those flux tubes. And so uh, the first question is, what do you think about that? Is, and magnetic criticality has been uh, the paradigm for a long time. But in reality, it seems like you can always get enough material 
to make a cloud or a core magnetically supercritical if you bring the material from, long, from far away enough, far enough away. And so that's one, uh, that's one point. So that's one question. I'll collect all the, collect all the questions uh, in the end. The second one is uh, yesterday Alex uh, mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned the scale at which gravity becomes dominant. Is really there such, such a thing? Uh, and an example, for example, is a singular isothermal sphere. This is, this is something that hit my brain when I was a grad student, that a singular isothermal sphere contains exactly one genus mass at each radius. So there is no single scale at which gravity becomes dominant. Gravity is equally important at all scales for a singular isothermal sphere. So does it make sense for us to talk about the scale at which gravity becomes important? Third one is uh, we have been hearing a lot about uh, thermal instability and phase transitions. Uh, so, but how relevant is uh, thermal pressure really to the dynamics? Anvar yesterday was asking I think very uh, uh, reasonably that if the thermal pressure is only like a minor fraction of the total pressure, does it really play any significant dynamical role? And this also brings us to the, uh, to the turn of the century when uh, again Carl and my team were sort of connected because we, on the, in 2000 we were pl uh, publishing this paper about whether the uh, thermal instability is really significant in turbulent galactic gas, and uh, Carl was publishing this paper on thermally, thermally unstable temperatures. And I, now I have matured a little bit, and um, so I can see both positive and negative answers to this question. One is not much because the, the thermal pressure is only a relatively small fraction of the total pressure. So one question is, one possibility is that the thermal pressure, like, like in Alex's talk, uh, two talks ago, Maybe the thermal pressure is just following the flow and is doing it whatever the flow is selling to do given the local density and temperature conditions. And in that case, what is the role and meaning of the thermally unstable gas? But on the other hand, maybe after all, it does play a, a significant role because at some point when you undergo a phase transition from the, cold, from the warm to the cold medium, your density raises by a factor of 100, your temperature drops by about the same factor to keep the, temp the pressure uh, more or less constant, but this implies that the genes mass, uh, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> this is divided, the genes mass drops by about a factor of 10 to the 4, and so the, the, uh, the thermal instability might actually be just playing the role to give you strongly gravitationally unstable gas. So that's uh, another teaser. Then another thing, oh, and I forgot that I wanted to ask uh, Blakesley about this is, Blakesley yesterday was telling us about density PDFs and how some of them uh, can really be considered to be log normals in, in turbulent flows. Yet uh, Joao Alves et al. have been telling us that actually molecular clouds have always power law density PDFs. So uh, is this a dilemma or does it have a simple solution? Uh, maybe I should have checked with Blakesley a little bit earlier, but in, so. Maybe she'll just tell us to scratch that question and, uh, and give us the answer. Um, another one is uh, what I was just talking about in my, in my talk, uh, this uh, MHD wave explanation or interpretation of the B, uh, magnetic field density relation. And, but of course, we know that Alex has been insisting on the possibility that it's due to turbulent reconnection. And Ellen Zweibel and Fabian Heitsch have an interpretation in terms of ambipolar diffusion. How can we tell? Uh, and that's a question for the observers. We can I'm a, tell. Huh? We can tell. OK, so maybe. OK. I hope you don't <laughs> scratch out uh, my, all my questions in five minutes. So. <laughs> and then. Uh, and uh, the discussion yesterday uh, from the polarization uh, observed uh, by Planck, uh, uh, or the residual polarization, that, and the discussion was in the, going in the direction that really on the galactic plane, even though we see a, plane, a magnetic field that is roughly parallel to the plane, maybe that's just the residual from who knows what uh, is doing, the, the magnetic field is really doing because the fluctuating component is probably larger than the mean field and, uh, and this is just the residual that tends to, tends to have all fluctuations cancelled out by integration along the line of sight. 
So what is the real role of the magnetic field on the galactic plane? Does it make any sense to have, like Don Cox used to have uh, several years ago, uh, the idea that the magnetic pressure helps to support and provide the thickness of the, of the, di of the, gas, the gaseous disk or not? And uh, the last one is uh, just, uh, we have been talking about filaments, but, and we have been, I support the idea that they are driven by gravity in molecular clouds. There are the, uh, the filaments in the diffuse medium that may be linked to the magnetic field, or maybe not, because after all, we get filamentary clouds very near to us, even with spurs and all that stuff. Uh, in a medium that is not self-gravitating nor very strongly magnetized. So there might be other mechanisms to produce these things. And so with that, I uh, just leave all these questions up and uh, I open the floor for comments. Thank you. Okay, Alex. <laughs> so Alex says that... Uh, First of all, I would like to eliminate uh, the question uh, uh, number five. Mm -hmm. My answer is very simple. No turbulent air connection, no the process that alternatively was discussed by Ellen and uh, Fabian and other uh, people that are not only Ellen and uh, Fabian who were talking about. Why? Because uh, it, uh, for that process, you need a connection. Yes, Fabian uh, made uh, two, um, essentially 2D simulations where he avoided reconnection, but he was uh, moving magnetic field lines parallel to each other. If you uh, are living in three-dimensional world and raise the hands who think that we are living in two-dimensional world, anyone? Pardon? See, okay, uh, six dimension, but not two-dimensional. If uh, you believe that we are not uh, living in two-dimensional world, in this case, you are, when you are trying to mix magnetic field lines, they are not exactly parallel. And if you do not allow these magnetic field lines to reconnect, you never have this mixing motions which were seen in uh, the uh, simulations that uh, Fabian Heitch and Zweibel uh, uh, demonstrated uh, their ambipolar diffusion, uh, turbulent ambipolar diffusion. Moreover, there is uh, another thing uh, why it's not uh, relevant, and uh, this is because uh, when we, for example, mixing sugar and coffee. Do we care about uh, the diffusivity of uh, uh, coffee, molecular diffusivity? My answer is no, unless you believe that you need to mix sugar and coffee in four months. This is what uh, uh, your molecular diffusivity will give you. As soon as you introduce turbulence, you easily um, produce homogenization on uh, the scales of the turbulent eddy. To have turbulence uh, um, uh, which you can mix, you need a connection. So I hope we can uh, uh, do with it. And I would like also to uh, uh, eliminate the question too. Maybe we should do that yeah, next time. Okay, okay, but uh, the less uh, questions, the more uh, <laughs> time to <laughs> consider. <laughs> okay, Amber had uh, a question. Come. I think perhaps the problem is that mass to flux ratio isn't dimensionless. Sorry? Mass to magnetic uh, flux isn't dimensionless, and it's dangerous to characterize things in terms of dimensionless quantities, right? I think the situation will become clearer mm -hmm. if this criterion is formulated in terms of dimensionless quantities. Mm -hmm. Well, but norm yeah, normally people just taking the position, not that I defend them before diffusion, well, but well. taking the position of, uh, of the people who do, they would say that what matters is the, uh, the, the relative uh, mass-to-flux ratio compared to the critical value. True, true, true. 
uh, you can in the same way say what matters is the velocity versus viscosity for the behavior of the flow. Mm -hmm. But it's Reynolds number which controls it, right? Right, mm -hmm. dimensionless number. Yeah, that's so what they would call it. Empirically, you standard. would start with something dimensional, but then eventually, I think one should develop equivalent criterion formulated in terms of dimensionless quantities. And maybe perhaps to start with, just looking at this ratio per unit length, mm -hmm. if it's at U long filament per unit length, this must be the important thing. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to say that in terms of the mass to flux ratio, that uh, I agree with what Enrique said. It is dimensionless uh, when you uh, use it, the normalized value. So it's just like the Reynolds number. Mm -hmm. But uh, the issue is that the way it's normally defined, uh, you have a magnetic critical mass, which is proportional to the flux, which is scale dependent. But if you go back in history to the initial uh, treatment, uh, before we had that critical mass, there was a different one, which uh, varies like b cubed over n squared, which is an intrinsic mass. And that then, uh, the issue that you're raising, where if you keep on going along the flux tube, eventually it'll get to be magnetically critical, uh, doesn't happen. There it's, you have a number, which is the uh, mass relative to b cubed over the square of n, and uh, then either you're supercritical or, or subcritical. Yeah, but in that case, for the, for the galactic gas, what would matter is perhaps just like the average for the entire galaxy or something like that. And in that uh, case, it, everything you, would be supercritical. You super are going to have to define you know, what region you're looking at, which would then determine the mean field and the mean density uh, to, uh, in order to determine whether that's magnetically critical or supercritical. I, I guess the, the main point of my question there is that you always have to link it to what's outside of it, because you, you have motions that can bring material along from further and further away. So there is like not a single mass that you can talk about, for example. Huh? Well, no, I'm saying there is. Uh, I agree that, that uh, n, the density of a region can evolve due to flows, as you showed with converging flows. Mm -hmm. But at any instant of time, there is a, it's a unique mass that's defined. And then you can compare that with the amount of gas that's actually there. OK. Edith? Uh -huh. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the total mass in the fl flux tube. It, it's the mass that is at a density high enough to emit in CN. So it, it's, there is a, well, a uh -huh. physical selection. But that's what, it's not physical, it's what you can see. Huh? But it, it's not physical, it's just what you can see. But the, there is more mass that may be, in other words, how is the ma dynamical mass related to the mass okay, that you can I, see? Okay, I agree, but it, it's, uh, the, it's dense gas, so the, the, the gas that is susceptible to collapse. But if you can increase the mass of that gas... Yes, but I agree with Chris, with that, it could evolve with time, but at that time, uh, there is that yeah, But if it can evolve with time, then, it, then you can start with something that is subcritical and eventually become supercritical because you can collect matter from far enough. Mm -hmm. and, there, and then the fact that it was subcritical at the beginning has no meaning. No, but the, also the time scales are become tremendously long because you say it circles around the galaxy, the field lines, but they, they are probably connected to the outer galaxy world and intergalactic medium. So it, uh, the time scales reach the Hubble time. So Yeah, uh, and then it depends on what is the mass that is gravitationally linked, right? So uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, some other? Priscilla? Uh -huh. Okay. I, I was going to change the topic a tiny bit and ask a question about number seven. You have stars moving through the interstellar medium, and they—they're like a piston. They deform the gas and the magnetic field in what looks like a filamentary structure in the infrared emission. So, what happens after the star has gone by? What happens to that structure that they created? Sorry, I, I sort of missed it. But uh, does anybody want to make a comment, or you want to? No, that was, a, that was a question. Happens? Yeah. So, what happens to? What, the filaments were? The effect of astrophilaments. Oh. Yeah, it's the effect of a star moving through the interstellar medium and okay. stirring up the magnetic fields. It's another way of introducing oh, impulsive um, pressure into the interstellar medium. OK. Uh -huh. After 10 years of being retired, I'm a little nervous about addressing this organization, but I have some comments on some of these points. OK. So um, 
You mentioned that we, uh, Bularis and I, tried to support the interstellar medium with various pressures and got, mm -hmm. a, got it raised to quite a, a great height. And I don't see how that can not be the case, even if the field is moving around in funny ways. On average, it's, it's pushing like mm -hmm. elbow and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's going to, in some places, it'll be, be pulling down if you have something that's looping down. Mm -hmm. But on the outside of that, it's pushing up too. And then when it's like that, it's pulling up. and on average, it's going to be providing one third of the support of the interstellar medium. Mm -hmm. So that's thing number one. Um, mechanisms for forming filaments other than magnetic fields and self gravity. It seemed to me that I, I used to have a picture of the Pleiades on the back door, my inside door of my office, mm -hmm. and I often wondered if anybody had ever tried to see if there was any magnetic field in the filaments around that. Does anybody know? It seemed like. Those structures are more likely the ones in that you, you showed in the clouds in the sky that they're formed by um, stuff just being stretched out. Mm -hmm. I forget what the word is for that, but in any case, just what's that called? I think it's just stretching now because they call it vortex stretching for the vortices. But yeah. Uh -huh. Well, he says extruding. Okay. I, I had a better word before I stood up, but <laughs> in any, any case, just <laughs> a blob of stuff that gets surrounded by a flow and gets entrained and stretched out. So mm -hmm. they get a long linear structure. Yeah. Um, so that might as well that might well be at play in the incompressible W and M because the W and M at, at higher temperatures behaves rather incompressible incompressibly. It, it, the Mach number is of order unity, so it's not terribly compressible until you get down to. So in question three, is thermal pressure relevant to the dynamics? Maybe not everywhere, but in some places, surely it's very important. It, Mm -hmm. um, when you have a supernova remnant, you get yeah. you get high pressures inside, and that plus the kinetic energy pushing outward is is definitely a significant Absolutely. form of the pressure. And I, in I, super I, bubbles, I imagine the thermal pressure is high also in the interior. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that, guess, that question I guess actually maybe it's time for me to sit down. But I I wanted to say earlier uh -huh. that uh -huh. there was a let's see. Alex Hills asked, why is there a three-phase interstellar medium? And it's because Cox and Smith said so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you're totally right about the super bubbles. My, my question there actually, sorry, I should have been more precise, referred more to these phase diagrams of the pressure versus the density and referring to the three-phase ISM or the multi-phase ISM. But uh, like Alex was showing us, it seems like somehow, no matter what you do, the <laughs> The medium always manages to uh, to arrange itself in order to be on that pressure range. And so, could it be that it's just because of the cooling and heating rates that it's uh, feeling uh, that the thermal pressure is just doing what it has to do, but not really playing a significant role? For example, in confining clouds and you know, going from the warm medium to the cold medium, and so on. Alex. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, Chris mentioned this the other day that the, I mean. The turbulent pressure acts on larger scales than the uh, than the thermal pressure. So, you know, phase transitions are con are going to be controlled mostly by thermal pressure, um, and so individual clouds that are in thermal pressure equilibrium, the thermal pressure equilibrium, they wouldn't be in thermal pressure equilibrium if the pressure if the pressure equilibrium didn't matter. And the, the so it clearly does on some level. Well, uh, that see that's that's a, the the point. So you undergo a phase transition. You you're compressing the material, right? And then all of a sudden, your density, local density and temperature imply some cooling rates that imply, in turn, a phase transition to the cold phase. But the pressure remains the same. So there's, there's actually no pressure gradient, and the material just keeps flowing. So there is no really so anything like a confining effect. Or, so it's not really pressure balance. It's just like pressure equality. Uh -huh. that, that's what I was meaning. Uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, I just want to respond, and then. Uh -huh. I mean, and I mean, we don't see anything like the classic Makia striker cloud that's just sitting there surrounded. And, and I guess so. So maybe that's speaking to your point. If the uh, if we saw Makia striker clouds, that would mean that the pressure is controlling the dynamic, that the pressure is controlling the dynamics. If it's just a flow and the the phase transition does what it does, then that would. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, we we, we so, so we so we see one. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, okay. We, we uh, as in the astronomical community, see hundreds of isolated, diffuse interstellar clouds showing two-phase internal structure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I guess the question is, but is, just the, is the pressure just following the flow, or is it controlling the dynamics? That, that, uh, you know, that's the, but I totally admit that I'm biased by my numericist point of view that who's controlling what, no? I think the, what, did you? Uh -huh. I sort of just have a comment to the question number seven, which uh, may not be very illuminating. It's just that the, we have so many different sort of filaments or filamentary structure, and you saw them in turbulence-dominated simulations in MHD, and also in <coughs> Lambda CDM, because the distribution of galaxies and those structures, so, so that is purely gravitationally dominated um, phys physics. Well, you, you, it's expanding universe. So it's very different when you have self-gravitating structures or spurs or things just along that I could describe, like flux tube. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably more complex than just using the word filament. Uh, maybe we, we have to slowly develop some more descriptive and better sort of physically based uh, terminology sets. Right. Yeah, well, people use, have used fibers, filaments, and what They're else? They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. I totally agree. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, Josh? Oh, no? So on point number four, just okay. quite simply, there's actually no controversy between those two papers. So mm -hmm. in Joao's paper, they very simply point out that op an observational fact that it's not possible to uh, observe with any sort of fidelity the, the shape of the density PDF below AV of about one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's in dust emission and dust extinction. Mm -hmm. They didn't say anything about any other tracers other than dust. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a problem with the dust. So in our paper, we just simply said there are other ways of tracing the low column density gas in molecular clouds, namely H1. And so Perseus was the first example of that um, using the data from, from Min Young Lee's uh, paper in 2012. And so we show that the H1 does, in fact, trace a very nice log normal PDF and that the cutoff in the H1 PDF traces the H1 and H2 transition. Well, so there's no, uh -huh. there's no discrepancy between those two papers at all, because one's dealing with dust observations solely, and the other is dealing with multi-wavelength, multi-phase observations. But, yeah, well, just to clarify my, my understanding of that paper, for those who, who are not efficient, density PDF aficionados, uh, Alves et al. have this paper called that all clouds have power law density PDFs. And uh, yesterday, Blakesley, yesterday or the day before, Blakesley told us that, no, that the H1 does show uh, their, their title PDF. is misleading. Pardon so me? they did, their, their title is specifically that molecular clouds have log or have power law right. PDFs, mm -hmm. but that's only best traced by dust. And their point really just is we can't know in the dust observations what's happening below AV of one. So it's, it's, just a, it's just an issue of yeah. the dust as the, a tracer. That, that's one point. The other point is that they claimed, and I think this is where, the again, the boundaries of where we're looking are important. Because what they were saying is that, if I remember correctly and from my conversations with Joao, that you, the problem is that you are undersampling the low density gas. Because normally, when you define a cloud, you define it by a density threshold. So by definition, you're not looking at what's below. Uh, and therefore, what, uh, what I understood that they're claiming is that the, the larger the region that you look, the less uh, the turn down at low densities happens. And in fact, you know that if you went far enough, low down enough in density, you should see the bimodal PDF of the two-phase medium. So, uh, uh, and if my understanding is correctly, they were showing that the further out from the center of the cloud that you see, the, the more that you see the low density stuff coming up, because now you're sampling more evenly the, the low density and the high density stuff. That, that's one point they made. They also made the point that mm -hmm. the foreground background subtraction in the dust mm -hmm. extinction data also changes the shape of the PDF. Okay. But again, this is all in dust mm -hmm. in particular. Now, when we look with simulations, you can play with the you know, density threshold in the simulation, you still see at the low density, everything looks log normal. Mm -hmm. And if you include self-gravity, the highest density gas shows mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the power law tail. Right. Uh -huh. And that seems consistent when one starts to include H1 data. 
But in the H1, shouldn't you see then the, the second peak? At, not, uh, not in column of the density. Warm phase? So in the, th in the 3D density data, you can see multiple peaks uh, in, three, in 3D due to the warm and the cold gas separately. And if you do temperature cuts, uh, then you can see individual log normals in the 3D simulations. In, in projected okay. column density, it always looks log normal in, in simulations that include thermally unstable gas. Okay. And I just want to make one point on number seven. <laughs> okay. There are other mechanisms. So mm -hmm. you pointed out the, the pictures of clouds, but shocks. Mm -hmm. So hydrodynamic shocks right. also can form very long, skinny filamentary structures. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to include self-gravity. You don't need to include uh, MHD in order to get those kind of filaments. And so shocks are another mechanism that we should be thinking about to form filaments. And of course, this has been like a sort of theory dominated discussion. So for the observers, uh, uh, what are the suggestions or, or for the interaction between the observers and the theoreticians? How can we distinguish between the different mechanisms? So I see uh, Nes and then Josh uh -huh. and then Peter. <laughs> Actually, as an observer, I wanted to say that I'm confused because <laughs> you said in your talk that to form dense cold gas, you need to compress and you need to go from really large scales, talking from about like 500 parsecs. So my first question is, how can we observationally distinguish that? Um, and the other question is, so Eva showed that her 3D MHD simulations showed that it's actually hard to make cold, dense gas in colliding flows. And if she adds magnetic fields, it's even harder. So the fraction of the CNM, it's even smaller. So I'm just trying to connect those two things and think about possible observational ways we can test this. Right, yeah, the, there I, I would answer that. Uh, it becomes harder the more oblique the magnetic field and the velocity field are, right? Um, but there was this paper also from Enebel and Perot in 2000 where they were looking at what are the requirements for a certain oblique flow to be redirected along the magnetic field and then become parallel to the field. And they came up with a criterion so that for a given uh, oblique, obliqueness angle, there is a certain minimum Mach number that the, uh, that the collision must have in order for the flow to be reoriented and then become longitudinal with the field. And in that case, it's easy. It's relatively easy to form the, the cold gas. The question is, can we think of an observational scenario? No, I think we need to discuss in order to do that. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so I said, Josh and Peter, uh -huh, and, and then Eva. Uh -huh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I've had in my head for a long time that theorists disagree about the rate at which molecular clouds form. You have, you know, is there really something like the scale at which gravity becomes dominant? Mm -hmm. Although sometimes I find when I ask in detail, I find trouble finding differences. Mm -hmm. So I guess I might ask the theorists who think about the rate at which molecular clouds form at large, what would you predict for the um, rate of flow of material into a molecular cloud, you know, a kiloparsec away, uh, 100 parsecs away, 10 parsecs from the core uh, for different kinds of molecular clouds? Do you think, do you agree on the distinctions between different theories? Is there a consensus on the distinctions and what those distinctions would look like in terms of the rate of flow of material into a cloud for different kinds of clouds? Yeah. I, and, uh, 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 somebody wants to answer that? Short? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, uh, <laughs> there are really big differences, and I will be short. If you assume flux freezing, you need to go maybe a kilopasak. And this was shown by, clearly by Moscovius. And if you take into account that in turbulent media, and we believe that uh, interstellar media is turbulent, there is a violation of flux freezing. It, it has been shown also numerically. In this case, it's uh, more like you know dozens of uh, parsec. The usual uh, scales that people were thinking, uh, talking about ambipolar diffusion. The only difference is that ambipolar diffusion is not relevant. <laughs> OK, uh, I had uh, Pris, Pris, Peter, and Eva, and I think then we should be done. Uh -huh. So I, as far as I know, there's a gap in theoretical work in looking what happens to an, a super bubble shell that's highly evolved past, you know, when it's still moving 
20 kilometers per second through the local standard of rest, such as the clouds around the sun, but the magnetic field is perpendicular to the motion of the cloud. So would you have, in this case, locally, the velocities of the clouds are ordered by the magnetic field, but I have not been able to find any discussion of that theoretically, I mean, of, of what happens to an evolved super bubble shell. What would you expect to see? And these are low column density, less than 10 to the 19. So that's just an open question. Maybe somebody knows the answer. Maybe it's been done. Yeah. Maybe Eva wants to respond to that. And we can lend her the microphone and then Peter. Sorry, just to keep the flow. But then Eva and then Peter. Yeah. Oh, since uh, we said super bubble twice, I had <laughs> to answer. Uh, so, um, regarding the uh, evolved stage of the super bubble, you, you said that when it's about 20 kilometers a second, uh, the simulations I showed actually have these velocities towards the point where the super bubbles collide in the case where the magnetic field opposes the expansion and in directions where it opposes the expansion. Otherwise, they're a little bit uh, faster than that. But we are talking uh, slightly supersonic, right? Uh, so, in terms of uh, finding clouds or structures that are carried with a super bubble, uh, we can find them. Uh, what, what I would like to know is what is interesting for you to compare to in this context. What should we be looking for uh, in, uh, in, in this? Uh, The sun is in a very low density environment, so I don't know if there's another super shell. I, don't, I would be surprised if there was another super bubble shell that was colliding from the outside. We think it's the a series Orion, of super bubbles, super? a series of supernova explosions inside the same region. So it's, it's multiple supernovas, but instead of colliding, coming from opposite velocities, one of them is building in, you know, Another super bubble goes off inside of an original super bubble. That's the prevalent model for the local ISMs. The SCOSEN Association is the source of the super bubbles, of the explosions, the supernova explosions. But nobody's really modeled that to say what happens, you know, to the wall when you, you know, when you go, when you evolve in one, you know, you evolve, you evaporate clouds as a super bubble expands and it gets swept up in the next super bubble, what kind of instabilities would you see? Would it decelerate? Um, in particular, for the low, I didn't get, a, get to this in my talk, but it turns out that the velocities of the cloud system that we're in right now, which is less than 10 to the 19 per square, square, square centimeter um, column density, they are ordered by the magnetic field. The angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field is directly proportional to the cloud velocity. So there's something going on that's related to the super bubble shell, but there I haven't seen any kind of, you know, I'd love to talk to you more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's talk more. And maybe a short comment to what Snezana said, uh, the, the, the fact that we don't form as much cold gas in this context uh, is not just because there is a magnetic field, it's because it's a very specific uh, configuration of the colliding shells, thin colliding shells with a magnetic field opposing or bending. And it has been shown before, as Enrique said, that this is not the most favorable colliding flow scenario, and you can bend away from it. Uh, but uh, it will depend on the environment. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot make a. Yeah, just to. To complement on that, it it depends on how much material you accumulate. So, and a thick shell is not very much of material. But I think uh, Peter, I had been promising the microphone to Peter for a long time, so we should. <laughs> okay. So I just want to try and answer that question you asked a few minutes ago. Which one? Um, from an observer's point of view, what what should we be thinking about? And. Uh, point I would make is to not confuse emissivity with column density from an observer's point of view. That's a very important distinction. One of the main lessons we learned from doing the multi-transition mapping of the Southern Milky Way with thrums and now with Cetagism as well, mm -hmm. is when you do the uh, radi proper line ratio radiative transfer analysis, mm -hmm. you find, and you can compute maps and cubes, in fact, of column density as derived from the line ratios, you find that the column density maps don't look anything like any of the individual line maps. Uh, there is a complexity in the line ratios, which 
uh, doesn't show up until you do that column density calculation. So you have to be very careful uh, not to confuse what you see as an observer with what is underlying the emissivity that you actually measure. So an example of that is when we did that calculation, we uh, were able to compute um, spatially resolved values for the X factor, or the equivalent X factor. And what we found to our great surprise was that there was no X factor. There was a completely different relationship. And so I would, uh, I, I guess I would throw this back to uh, Edith and, uh, and, and make the point that I'm not sure about those Planck results that were showing uh, a constant X factor that seemed to uh, be a single number. It seemed to me that that relationship that was on that slide uh, actually looked very similar to the kind of power law we derived uh, that would have replaced the X factor by a slightly but importantly different relationship. So, and, and another corollary of that is that there does seem to be a large amount of subthermally excited uh, denser material uh, which could be, uh, and, and not particularly bright uh, molecular material, which could be uh, contain about as much mass as what people, people typically think of as the CO bright material. So that, that again bears on the question of what is the contribution of the CO dark gas to the total molecular content in the Milky Way. And it's, it's at least initially our results suggest that that may be smaller than what people have been talking about. Thank you. And so we had one more by Jay and then we finish. Huh? Yes, uh, one aspect of the clouds I showed on the first day that I probably should have emphasized more is that um, they are half a kiloparsec to a kiloparsec above the galactic plane, and yet they do not seem to have very strong random motions. So the only way that kind of makes sense is to ask how are you getting clouds that are co-rotating up at these distances is that these are in fact the remnants of super bubbles and that when it breaks up somehow it produces this population of clouds. I don't think that there's another good explanation, but that would be the answer of a question of what do old super bubbles look like. Well, I think we, we have to stop, right? So thank you to everybody for the discussion. <laughs>